Hi, I'm Kathy Driscoll with the Nature Foundation. Today we are going to review motion, force, and energy. So let's get started. What is motion anyways? Motion is described by an object's direction and speed. Speed, by definition, means how fast an object is actually moving. So when measuring an object's position over time, we can describe then its motion. But how do we measure motion? Well, we measure motion by speed, the time it takes an object to travel. So before we get started in our scientific experiments on how we can measure these objects moving, we need to know a few concepts. The first being kinetic energy and then potential energy. So energy may exist in two states, either kinetic energy or potential energy. So kinetic energy is the energy an object has because of its motion, and it can be converted to other types of energy, such as gravitational energy or potential um, electrical energy. And potential energy is energy that is mechanical or it's stored energy or it is energy caused by its position, like energy from a, an object like a ball on top of a hill that because of its position it can roll down the hill. But how does that happen? How can we change an object energy from potential to kinetic energy? The answer is force. So, if I take this car and I just give it a little push, what do you think is going to happen? What? Did you say that it might move? Very good. So if I push it just a little bit, it goes a little distance. Again, this is measuring the distance. Okay. If I forced it with a bigger push, what do you think is going to happen? You think it might take off and roll down the hill like that ball? Well, let's see. Almost. So force is one way we can change an object's energy and start that object in motion. One of our great pioneer scientists had figured out a lot of things about motion and gravity. You may recognize the name as in Newton, Sir Isaac Newton. He took the time to pay attention to things like, how does things fall from the sky? How come things don't fly away like they would on Mars? Well, with all of this thought process in his mind and trying some scientific experiments, he came up with some pretty cool laws that we still utilize today as far as objects and how they move and how energy is occurring. Okay? The first law of Newton is the law of motion and we describe that as a force, that a velocity of an object is not going to change without um, force or an object at rest stays at rest. Okay? And we prove that with the car. Well, that's all well and done, but we're not the only things that can create force. Other things can force an object to move. Air, for example. So, with this balloon, if I blow this balloon up and filled it with air, what do you think is going to happen? All right, well, there was air in it. I added more air and I expanded that balloon. But what if I put this balloon here on the table and released it? What do you think is going to happen then? Let's see. One, two, three. It hits Kathy in the face. Well, actually, no, it not only did that, 
but it also proves another law of Newton. The second law of Newton, and that is through science, we know that the acceleration of an object is dependent on the amount of force as well as its mass, the object's mass. How heavy is this? So if this was a really heavy car, I would not be able to push it very far. So the lighter it is, it might be the easier for me to create force and move this along. And the same thing with the balloon. If I added more air into the balloon, then it would push away from this object, which is stronger than the balloon, and push itself off, much like, well, the Challenger, the Discovery, all of our, sh our, our shuttles that we've sent out into space had so much potential energy that it was able to push these space rockets into space off of the Earth, just like I did with the air. So, we're going to do a couple of more scientific experiments to prove Newton's second law of motion. So, can anyone tell me how air can make a jet fly? Well, according to Newton's third law of motion, he said there, for every action, there is a reaction. In this case, with a jet, it takes in the air and pushes it back, so therefore it propels the jet forward, as I'm demonstrating here. Whoa. Okay, so if we were to take this balloon and create pressure inside of this balloon. This would be considered one body and it can interact with another body. In this case I'm going to use a straw and I'm going to attach it to the straw like this. And the straw is actually um, threaded through a fishing line. So I've got the fishing line taut and I've got all of this pressure, this force, built up inside of this balloon. What do you think is going to happen? Let's make sure it's tight so it doesn't hit me in the face again. Okay, you ready? Let me see if I can do a count. Blast off! And poof! So the pressure that was released from inside that balloon went in that direction and it propelled the balloon to go in the opposite direction. And thus we have demonstrated Newton's third law of motion. Excellent. Okay, I have one more concept to share with you today on motion in energy and force, and that is friction, which is another form of force. So what do we think of when we think of the words friction? Well, if you put your hands together and you rub them really, really fast, it actually creates energy. In fact, friction is a form of a force that works against gravity. But in this case, do your hands feel kind of hot? Yeah, that is friction. We created friction. So what is gravity then? Hmm. Well, as I said, Sir Isaac Newton knew what that was about. In fact, there was a story about him actually sitting under an apple tree, pondering all of these thoughts about motion and energy when an apple fell on his head. Boop! And to him, I guess it was like a light bulb. As in, how did that apple fall on my head? Gravity, of course, it was attracted to a body. In this case, the center of the Earth, because it has mass. So, gravity is the force that attracts a body to something else that has mass. In that case, it hit him on the head, 
and hence we have now these laws that have not been changed since. So let's talk about friction with an experiment that I have here, a demonstration of, <coughs> of a cork and I'm going to use this cardboard and I'm going to try to make this, this round cork move. And I don't mean like this. I'm going to put it on the cardboard here. Okay. So we talked about potential energy when a ball or something is, is sitting on top of a mountain or the apple hanging from a tree and it gets windy and the apple snaps. That started that kinetic energy to potential energy where it, the object is now in motion. So let's try that with this cork and we're going to try to create um, <coughs> a, this to move from kinetic to potential energy. So as I lift this cardboard up, what do you think will happen with this cork, this round cork? Will it move down? So far it's not going anywhere. Well that's what we're calling friction. It causes two objects to work against each other. But if I raise this ramp a little bit higher, then ooh, it slid down. So the force of friction is greater than the force of gravity. So I had to adjust gravity to overcome that friction that was going on with this object. And you know what else? With this experiment, we can try it with different types of surfaces. So, um, <clears throat> if I have a smooth surface and I attempt this, science experiment where I am going to create a hill, thus gravity. Do you think this will slide down faster than the cork or slower? What did I hear? Did I hear slower? Really? Well, this is actually aluminum. So think about the texture of aluminum. Okay, you ready? Here I go. And see, we can do this scientifically with a demonstration of using a, um, a ruler and you measure how steep your hill is or your slope is for each one of these objects. So in this case, as I'm going higher up, I would measure the distance from the top of my, my cardboard to the table. And then I would write down that number. So that's probably about three inches, okay? Let's try that with the cork again. Measuring, waiting, oh boy, friction's really holding on here. Ugh. Okay, so intuitively you can see that this is much higher. And if I were to measure it, it's about six inches, okay? And then I have one more. This is actually covered with sandpaper. Sandpaper's pretty rough. So think about this. What is your hypothesis on this one? If I, how high would I have to raise this um, cardboard or make a steep incline in order for this round circle of sandpaper to move from kinetic energy to potential energy? Would you say less than three inches? More than six inches? What? Stop talking all at once. You guys are answering all at the same time. I can't hear when everybody's talking. Okay, I'm going to say more than six. One, two, three, four. Mm. All right, it's going, it's going. Ugh, finally. Wow, this is almost perpendicular to the table. So this is well above six inches. So what is our result? This causes more friction and needed more gravity in order for this to be able to move from the top of the incline to the bottom. And this, my friends, is the last of our demonstrations on force, energy, and motion. I actually have um, some links for you guys to look at and a, an experiment if you want to do on your own, but you'd have to have three different kinds of marbles or balls 
Actually, I bet you could modify it with other types of objects that you can create um, for them to have motion. All right? So don't forget, let the force be with you. See you next time.